So welcome everybody um, to uh, to this um, workshop or seminar rather. Um, my name is uh, Peter Drahosh and uh, gives me a lot of pleasure to welcome Vera Aksionova um, from uh, the School of Transnational Governance where she's visiting at the moment. Uh, Viera hails from the uh, University of uh, Vienna, where she's uh, running a project uh, on expert knowledge in times of crisis. Uh, one yearns for a title, expert knowledge in the time of peace, but I guess that'll be quite a while before we get such a title. Um, I uh, will hand over to Viera without any further ado. She'll speak for about 40 minutes, and then we'll have a, our usual uh, dialogue about the about the seminar. So please take it away. Thank you so much for, for having me. Thank you so much for the very nice introduction. I hope people online can also hear me well. Um, so a lot of what I will be talking about today is based on my uh, project um, titled Expert Knowledge. And now it's so uh, the project uh, is on expert knowledge in times of crisis, uh, and I'm particularly interested in um, expert uh, knowledge produced and communicated by organized expert groups, and specifically looking also into think tanks as um, sort of organized, uh, institutionalized groups of experts. Um, and the project is guided in a way by three sets of questions. So first of all, um, how experts are trying to influence policies in countries beyond consolidated liberal democracies. Um, so I'm primarily interested in um, non-democratic or hybrid political regimes. How do they communicate crisis um, in such environments? And I'm specifically focusing on crisis, uh, knowledge production about crisis and during the times of crisis and communication of this knowledge. Um, how this knowledge transmits to the general public, so how media, for instance, uses this knowledge, and how this knowledge is also being used and at times misused or abused by political actors to their own ends. Um, the project is um, overall spent three years, and I'm now at the end of my second year. And um, it centers on three particular country cases, on Russia, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. I look into three crisis instances overall in this project, and these are the climate crisis, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, the uh, currently the current uh, full-fledged war against Ukraine. So once I was writing the project proposal, I was planning to actually focus on the situation of the military crisis that emerged in 2014. But once I started already the project, the situation changed and it became more current and in a way more logical to focus on the current situation rather than focusing on what was going on in 2014 and right immediately afterwards. Um, and in this project, I um, draw on, on a mixed method design. So I look into uh, both uh, the published work of think tanks. So I, I use content analysis of the publications of think tanks focusing on the public domain of their activities, but also um, do expert interviews, for instance, with the think tankers to understand how think tanks kitchen, internal kitchen works, uh, which channels of influence they try to use and how, if they at all try to influence particular policies and political decision-making and how they influence or not uh, certain societal processes. Um, the project overall comprises five studies. So this is not a book-centered uh, project. These are rather sort of studies that are guided by those questions, but they, that are in a way separate in their logic. Uh, and in two of these studies, I focus specifically on completely non-democratic, so on autocratic environments, on the case of Russia and the case of Kazakhstan. Uh, and today, towards the end of, of my presentation, or in the second half of my presentation, I will focus on one of these studies, particularly the case of Russia, and how Russian think tanks communicated the COVID-19 crisis and the climate change. Um, another study focuses on, um, or actually all three, uh, the, the rest of the studies, they focus on the case of Ukraine. So this information is basically everything which I shared with you already, and those are the 
two studies that I mentioned. Um, study number three focuses is a bit of an outlier in the overall project because in this particular study, I focus on uh, not on think tanks but on um, dialogue professionals, so uh, professional dialogue facilitators and mediators as uh, a group of experts in their own field. And I look into how they produce knowledge and attempted to produce also norms to regulate uh, dialogue funding and dialogue projects uh, in the case of Ukraine uh, in the period preceding the full scale war, so before 2022. And final, uh, the, the final two studies of this project, they focus also on Ukraine, but in the case, uh, in this case, on think tanks. And one of the studies is uh, still in progress. This is the uh, Ukrainian think tanks as policy entrepreneurs and public diplomacy actors in times of war. So here, I basically look into how they adopted their work and their public diplomacy or expert diplomacy, as they call it, efforts to reach out also to European audiences, for instance, in the times of the full fledged war. Um, and the final study is in a way a spillover of that uh, of that larger study, uh, where together with my colleague uh, and, and co-author, Katerina Loska, uh, we um, encountered so many challenges while collecting data for the main study that we decided that it was necessary to reflect on that. And we wrote another piece that has just been accepted uh, in the Journal of International Relations and Development, which is a methodological reflection on how we conduct uh, expert interviews in a hybrid kind of field work uh, environment uh, with Ukrainian think tankers during the uh, extreme time of, uh, during the time of extreme polarization in the world. Uh, so I won't be focusing on those studies. I will be focusing uh, towards the end of my presentation on this study on the case of Russia, but I will be happy to, to answer the questions also, also on the other studies um, that are ongoing or have just been finalized. Um, so first things first, think tanks, what are they? What, what kind of people are behind them? Um, there are a lot of definitions of what think tanks are, and I, I use in my project the definition by Hayan Stone. Uh, I find it very appropriate and also broad enough to account for different types of think tanks uh, that we can also find both in democratic but also in non-democratic environments. Um, and she defines think tanks as policy research institutes involved in systematic study and analysis of a particular policy area or a broad range of uh, policy issues actively. And this is the key uh, for me, how I distinguish basically when, when I'm trying to say something about my broader population of cases, but also the sample for particular studies. Um, so I look mainly into the institutions that actively seek to advise policy makers or inform public debate because the, the line between think tanks defined in this way and NGOs that sometimes take also on some of the some of the tasks of the think tanks, that is very fine line and we can discuss it later in, in the Q&A. Um, there has been a lot of interest in, in think tanks, academic interest, I mean, lately. These are just some examples, not all of them, of the books that have been published in the last 10 to 11 years. Uh, and if you look into the... Um, Engram of uh, on Google Books, and these are just the ones in English. Um, the interest, the academic interest, has been rising uh, quite steadily since the mid 1960s in in the think tanks. Um, what is, however, also noticeable once we look in a bit closer into those publications on think tanks is that the majority of them are focusing on the think tanks in the global north. In most of the cases, also on the democratic or more open political environments. Um, there are some exceptions, certainly there are also some uh, cross-regional studies, but they are the minority. Um, so we still know relatively little about how expert communities and also particular think tanks as sort of embodiments, this organized institutionalized embodiments of these expert communities work in non-democratic and hybrid political environments. Um, yet, if we look into, into the reality, the reality actually looks quite different because um, slightly more than a slight majority sort of, of the think tanks overall, if we speak quantitatively, so in terms of the numbers of think tanks, they're actually not necessarily based in the global north. Um, they are based elsewhere. If we look into the country distribution, and this is data from 2020, so not too current, but probably the latest that we have on the global scale, we will see here also that in the top three, we have two countries that are not located in the global north. Um, and we will also see in the top 15 uh, that there are two countries that have 
uh, sort of ambitions to play a global role as alternative leaders. Um, not only that, but they also actively use think tanks uh, in their public diplomacy actors. Uh, in Russia, for instance, this has been defined as part of the public diplomacy strategy uh, that the expert communities and think tanks in particular are being used uh, as part of uh, the efforts of the country, uh, as, as part of the public diplomacy expert, uh, efforts. Um, now, this is very much connected to um, uh, the question of what functions think tanks and expert communities perform in countries like Russia, for instance, or countries like China. Um, and based on, on Yizdiaska and uh, Justi, I distinguish between three types of such functions. Um, on the one hand, they do play an advisory role, of course. So there is also in non-democratic regimes uh, demand for particular expertise that is being provided, especially in, in certain areas, for instance, economic and financial expertise is very much on demand. Uh, but also in environmental area, for instance. So um, they can provide and develop sort of innovative capacities, propose policy solutions in particular policy areas. Uh, and in exercising uh, this advisory function, uh, they, in non-open political environments, so beyond consolidated political, uh, consolidated democracies, um, they do not have to challenge those in power. So they neither challenge them nor bow to them and in a way become a transmission bell between the society sort of and the government. So explaining government policies to the society and simultaneously providing expertise to the government. Um, they can also perform another function. So they can be in opposition to the government and or to the government policies uh, to partic in particular areas. So in, in this capacity, they would challenge uh, the government or particular political decisions and in a way can become also subversive agents of change depending on how closed or how open the uh, window of opportunity is in such a political regime for the, for the um, expert groups. And finally, they can also become legitimizers of uh, political leadership of uh, sort of central power or of particular uh, political decisions. And this becomes uh, most um, important in times of crisis because uh, in times of crisis, this is not only the time when you have the greatest demand for expertise, but you have also the need to uh, manage the crisis and community, uh, you, you need an app strategy for communicating the crisis and crisis response measures to the broader audiences. And this is where the uh, think tanks um, and expert communities at large can become very um, important actors uh, in terms of legitimizing government actions. Um, the way how think tanks position themselves uh, towards the government and uh, which functions they perform depends very much on those three factors, on their institutional affiliation, on the funding and agen agenda setting. Institutional affiliation in the sense that whether they are uh, in organizational terms, um, a part of the government in a way an extension perhaps of government structures, something which we do observe in many post-Soviet countries, for instance, uh, or whether they position themselves as independent entities. Um, are they uh, political party affiliated or are they business affiliated? Um, that very much also is connected to the question of funding, of course. So if there is one particular source of funding, whether this is government or a particular Preparation, for instance, the expectation could be that that would mess with the agenda setting of the um, think tanks and would influence that agenda setting. Um, however, this agenda might be also set not only by those who are providing funding and not necessarily also by think tanks, uh, individual experts themselves, but uh, the um, um, ideology that is driving this think tank. So the ideology with which the think tank identifies itself. Uh, it can be a um, left to right sort of spectrum. It could be also like in the case of Ukraine, we do not have the clear orientation between the left and right, but rather if we observe the think tank communities in Ukraine, um, they are very much aligned uh, in terms of geopolitical, in, in geopolitical terms, especially before 2022, that was the case. Right now we do not have really uh, pro-Russian uh, part of the spectrum anymore present in Ukraine. Um, 
Now, these questions um, are also connected to the questions of, to the other two main questions in the study of think tanks. And these are also two main questions in my studies. Uh, these, are, these are the questions of influence or impact. Sometimes they are also used interchangeably in the studies of think tanks. One, are we talking about influence or impact on, or in particular area? Influence on whom? Are we talking uh, about influence on particular decision makers, either the government, individual le leaders or political parties? Um, how much influence do think tanks actually have is one of the most interesting, but also the one of the trickiest questions to study, of course, because there is no smoking gun in order to determine whether that particular initiative came specifically from that think tank or that idea or policy change came from a particular think tank initiative. This is very rare when we can trace the processes that closely, uh, but nevertheless, very interesting to trace those processes, of course, too. Um, in other targets of influence could be also the broader society. And what we observe in some of the non-democratic environments actually is that uh, think tanks, when they position themselves in opposition, especially to the government, and they are not funded by the state, um, they actually have very limited access to the policymakers. So in order to exert the influence, uh, they would turn to mass media and social media and would try to create pressure through other channels rather than directly approaching the government actors. Uh, finally, uh, think tanks can be also targeting not national political decision makers or not only society within the national borders of this particular state where they are themselves located, but rather the international community, international organizations, or like also in the case of uh, Ukraine that I observe in my studies is uh, that they try to uh, exert a lot of influence actually in Brussels. And that was the case already after 2014, not only now after 2022. So they invest actually a lot of efforts in not only trying to influence policies in Kiev, but rather also influence policies, uh, European policies towards Ukraine in Brussels. And those questions are very much related also to the final set of questions. And uh, those are related to uh, the question of credibility and independence of think tanks. Uh, because in order to claim credibility, think tanks uh, need to claim at, at least a certain degree of independence, or at least they need to show that, demonstrate that they are independent actors, that they are able to produce independent expertise, even if this is not necessarily the case. Uh, and in the literature, we can also find this differentiation between the three dimensions of independence, which are very much intertwined, of course, the political, financial, and intellectual. Um, and this is the, the question of independence is at the center of the um, uh, study of, of the first study that um, is part of, of this uh, project, Expert Knowledge in Times of Crisis, um, the study on responding to crisis in authoritarian environments, uh, Russian think tanks between policy evaluation and state endorsement. I have just submitted this paper and it is currently under review, but I'm happy sort of to, to share with you a few insights from, from it. So the study um, goes more in depth into the question of how think tanks communicate uh, crisis. In particular, in a comparative uh, way, I look into the COVID-19 and the climate change. So how they communicated these uh, two particular crisis instances, what messages did they try to convey to, uh, to political actors, but also to the general public, and especially to the general public, because I look in this particular publication only into the public domain of think tank activities. So I analyze their published work. Um, what strategies did they use to communicate uh, these messages? And what does it tell us about the intellectual independence of the uh, think tanks in authoritarian environments, specifically in Russia, but also to what extent we can generalize from the case of Russia to other contexts. And in this study, I zoom into two particular think tanks, uh, Russian Institute of Strategic Studies and the Valdai Discussion Club. The reason why I've chosen those two is that uh, Russian, they can be placed in a way in two quite different camps uh, of the uh, uh, state-linked think tank spectrum in Russia. Um, First of all, um, there are basically um, there's basically no um, possibility anymore for independent state independent think tanks to exist in Russia. 
mainly because of the existing uh, legislation on the so-called undesirable organizations and foreign agents. So there are almost no think tanks left that position themselves as state independent. But those two are in a way in very different cam uh, camps of state-linked or state-sponsored think tanks. Russian Institute of Strategic Studies is one of the oldest. It was founded in 1992. Um, and it actually has uh, its roots in the former Soviet KGB. And the current uh, director of the think tank, Mikhail uh, Flatkov, Flatkov, is actually uh, the uh, former foreign service, uh, head of the foreign, uh, foreign intelligence service of Russia. He is, by the way, by now under all sanctions that are that you can possibly think of. Um, after, especially after uh, February 2022. Um, this is uh, a very traditionalist, in a way, think tank, very inward looking. Um, they primarily target Russian speaking audience and um, they are considered to be, well, very well funded. So they have relatively big staff, so over 100 people who work there, although they do not disclose how many people exactly. Uh, the Valdai Club is very different in that regard. It is much younger. It was established in the 2000s, and it was established more as a platform for exchange among uh, both Russian but also international experts. So they branded themselves initially at this annual conference at the Valdai Lake, where they would invite the head of state. So back then, first Medvedev and then later Putin. That was their branding event where a lot of international experts, but also journalists and policymakers would come to those events in order to exchange with the Russian expert community. Many international experts also published for them. And this is also something very specific for that particular think tank, which functions as a platform for publication also, but not, not only by Russian experts themselves, but also by international, including Western European and American, for instance, experts. At least that was the case before 2022. So they position themselves as a kind of platform which is very open to the international, uh, to the global world. And uh, which is also, I think what, what is very telling is that both think tanks maintain web presences and Valdai's main page is in English and not in Russian. Um, what I do in this paper, I analyze uh, the discursive strategies used by the two think tanks in communicating the crisis. Um, and I use uh, the differentiation that I found in the literature and in, in an article by Carvalho from 2005, uh, the different, who differentiates between four different types of discursive strategies, analytical, evaluative, positioning, and relational. And I use a mixture of deductive and inductive approaches in order to identify the actual strategies. So while the typology is taken from the literature, the actual strategies are being identified based on both the literature and the text material that I analyzed. Um, a couple of words about the data. Uh, I collected manually from the think tank's uh, websites, uh, 634 publications. As I said, both think tanks maintain web presences in both Russian and English. So I collected uh, 383 publications in Russian and uh, there was slightly less identified in English. So uh, 251, not everything is translated into English, especially in the case of Russian Institute of Strategic Studies. Um, and the documents were collected in the time frame from January 2020 until February 2022. So the time frame oriented itself with the start and way with the, of the pandemic um, and ends just before the start of the full-fledged war against Ukraine, because after that, the discourse has shifted, of course, towards the war so much that there was no uh, sense. It, it didn't make any sense anymore to collect data on the COVID or climate change. For, uh, for the period afterwards. Um, so a few words about the findings. Um, the discursive strategies did differ overall, but maybe a couple of words also uh, about the formats of publications. Um, Russian Institute of Strategic Studies, uh, what they did, and I looked only into the think tech's websites, right? What they did was that they published a lot of very short, very Opinion, opinionated pieces. In many cases, these were short uh, expert commentaries uh, or interviews that they gave elsewhere. So that they gave to particular media outlets and that they would repost in several ways, slightly changed, but nevertheless conveying the same message all over again on their website. 
So it looks like it's several publications, but in a way it's the same thing, repackaged, repackaged several times, the same interview given pretty much to different media outlets and then reposted on their website. Um, they, in terms of content, they went into an extreme geopoliticization, as I call it. So a lot of their publications that focus on communicating COVID-19 pandemic focus on what the pandemic means uh, in geopolitical terms, what it means for the US, what it means for China, less so what it means for Russia. Um, what they did a lot uh, was they dramatized the situation, especially when discussing the uh, start of the pandemic, so the first wave between March and May 2020 in Western Europe and the US. In Western Europe, the situation in Italy was particularly used on many occasions in several publications to demonstrate lack of solidarity between the European member states, uh, to um, delegitimize in a way crisis response by uh, European leaderships. And at the same time, this was uh, positioned in, in uh, or presented in uh, contrast to how China and Russia themselves behaved. Um, so there was a lot of discreditation of the authorities, both uh, in the EU, but also in the US. And at the same time, a lot of endorsement of China and starting from June uh, 2020, also endorsement of Russia's uh, Sputnik uh, V vaccine and vaccine diplomacy as such. Um, in the case of Valdai, that was slightly different. Um, first of all, uh, the way they published was different. So they published longer um, also expert commentary, so opinion-based pieces, but also reports. Um, they also engaged in geopoliticization. So they many of the publications by uh, the Valde Club um, focused on what was called multipolarity, or multilateral also uh, fora. Uh, and a lot of emphasis was ma made on uh, suggesting that the old world order was coming to an end and Russia is well advised to search for alternative for and for alternative formats of international cooperation. With also a lot of endorsement of China as an emerging leader. Um, there were slightly more critical pieces uh, that would address uh, the crisis situation in general, so not only ab abroad, but also touching upon the situation sometimes in Russia. However, that was very much hidden or sandwiched, if you will. So if the situation was discussed elsewhere, you would have a couple of sentences uh, talking about Russia, and then the attention would shift again to the situation elsewhere in the world. Um, in most of the cases, uh, the actual crisis situation and the, especially the response apart from the vaccine diplomacy, the crisis response by Russian authorities was completely absent, also in the case of wild applications. And we remember that many of them were actually, were actually written by Western experts. They were not written by Russian experts. Um, communicating cli climate change was uh, different, actually. First of all, of course, much less attention for this period of time. For the, for the case of Russian Institute of Strategic Studies, I had even to expand the time span in order to look for further publications from previous period before January 2020 in order to have a slightly more substantial text body to analyze. Um, here, uh, Rees sort of followed an, an approach where they published more or less 50-50, so 50% uh, um, of their publications that covered uh, climate change were very short pieces where you could hardly derive any particular um, discursive strategies from. Uh, and part, partly they published actually in Russian academic journals where they very much uh, drew on scientification and globalization. So they discussed the crisis in the global sense without, again, touching too much the situation uh, in Russia specifically. Um, and in the case of Baldai, that was actually similar with the difference that they published, didn't publish in uh, academic journals, but they produced in the period between January 2020 and uh, uh, February 2022, they published four reports on climate change, discussing mainly the um, also the geopolitical um, and global consequences of climate change. And uh, one of the reports was, was more centered on energy politics and our energy markets. Um, so here, 
what we can see definitely is that the two prices will communicate differently. Uh, and while in the case of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Russian Institute of Strategic Studies already before February 2022, pretty much became not only um, a tool for state endorsement, but also an additional channel of state propaganda. In the case of Baldai, that didn't happen to the same extent. However, if we zoom out slightly to the meta strategies, what we can see is that both think tanks actually engaged into geopoliticization and by doing so shifted attention away from domestic emergencies and focused very much on the situation elsewhere. Um, they normalized crisis at home if they ever discussed the crisis situations in Russia. Um, and in doing so, they very much endorsed the state to different degrees using slightly different nitty gritties of the strategies, but nevertheless, they both engaged into state endorsement. Now, this study, of course, um, has limitations. First of all, limitations in terms of the generalizability of the findings with a view to both uh, selection of think tank cases, but also Russia as a country case. I'm looking, of course, only into two think tanks and how they communicated about the crisis. So uh, meaning that those are think tanks that are placed among the most influential ones. They are the bigger think tanks and they are what is called general generalized or general focused think tanks. So we cannot really say that based on that, we can completely sort of generalize to any kind of think tank, other kind of think tank based in Russia. So less influential ones, smaller ones that have less resources and those uh, that are more specialized and maybe focusing more on particular uh, issue areas. So that is certainly one limitation. Another limitation is that uh, Russia is, of course, a particular uh, context of an authoritarian state. Uh, Russia definitely has global ambitions, uh, global imperial ambitions, as we can see now with, with the start of the full-fledged war. Um, and not necessarily every authoritarian regime would be comparable to that, obviously. So whether uh, we would find same or similar communication patterns in uh, in writing about crisis in, in other cases, uh, that could be questioned, of course. Finally, while this study does provide interesting insights into how the think tanks communicate crisis, it doesn't really tell us about much about how their internal kitchen works. It doesn't, doesn't really tell us much about whether they communicate in a similar way about crisis behind the closed doors. So in the reports, and this is uh, an insight from, I didn't conduct expert interviews in the case of Russia, but I did conduct expert interviews uh, for the study in Kazakhstan. Um, and there I found out that around 80% of what think tanks of the, the analytical materials that they prepare, they do not become public. My assumption would be that in the case of Russia, this is similar. So a lot of what they prepare are internal documents, internal reporting, which is going directly to, in this case of uh, Russian Institute of Strategic Studies, at least, goes directly to the presidential administration. And we cannot say much about whether they communicate in those internal documents in a similar way about crisis as they do in their public domain. Now, while these are the limitations, they also point sort of um, into the directions for the future research, which could be promising and which I hope I would, would be able also to continue working on. Uh, one thing is uh, if we specifically focus on the case of Russia, it would be very interesting to look into how think tanks in, in, in a more systematic way, how think tanks use media and become um, either actors indeed or agents of propaganda or also opposing propaganda in some of the cases perhaps. Um, there have been studies uh, looking into uh, Russia propaganda, Russia's propaganda before and after 2022. However, they rarely focus on such actors as experts, as knowledge producers and communicators. And I think this is certainly a gap that could be closed, that could be addressed. Another uh, direction of research, um, looking into this internal functioning and advisory work of think tanks in liberal settings, something which in the current circumstances, certainly would be very difficult, uh, too impossible to do it for the case of Russia, but is certainly doable for other um, cases of liberal political settings. 
And finally, the direction that I find particularly interesting also for my future research are the cross-regime comparisons. So while right now in this project, I focus mainly on illiberal, so non-democratic to hybrid political environments, um, the actual comparisons between fully democratic, or I mean, that is a continuum or a spectrum, but nevertheless, between more democratic environments and completely non-democratic environments would be particularly interesting because uh, from anecdotal evidence and from the studies that I observe, my preliminary assumption would be that there are some similarities that could be quite unexpected. And it would be very interesting to see and, and to look into this question in, in a more systematic way and see whether that hunch or that assumption would actually hold true. So thank you so much for your attention and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Vera, for that really fascinating presentation. Uh, okay, the floor is now open for all questions or comments. Yeah, please kick off. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. That was really interesting. I was wondering about one of the latest things you mentioned in the presentation when you talk about Russia being an expansion or regime with expansionist ambitions. And I was wondering if there is a particular dialectical method that the think tanks um, were using that kind of reflects um, this a uh, particular type of regime, or if it's something that you would need to compare to, as you were saying, at uh, the other end of the spectrum to really see if there is any. Yeah, I think I'm wondering about particular regimes and whether they encourage or cause or um, are reflected in particular types of think tank communication. Okay. Um, in this particular study, I did I did look only into the case of Russia, right? So I can say most of, or my findings are based, of course, on the case of Russia. However, initially I collected data, uh, similar data actually for the case of Kazakhstan. Now um, we can argue about where exactly to place Russia and Kazakhstan on the continuum of the different regime types, right? So when I was starting uh, initially preparing the project, my assumption was that I would have a nice comparative approach of Russia, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. Kazakhstan back then being sort of the more typical case of an authoritarian regime, Russia sort of in a way more tending towards hybrid, whereas Ukraine being an outlier, being sort of hybrid tending towards more democratic, non-consolidated democracy kind of regime. Um, by the time I actually started working on the project, that has changed. Uh, Russia became pretty much full-fledged uh, dictatorship. Kazakhstan um, liberalized in a way after January events of 2022, which many maybe didn't really think of or forgot already or didn't even hear about, but nevertheless, there was some process of li political liberalization in Kazakhstan in the meantime. And uh, the data that I collected for both Russia and uh, Kazakhstan was the data on COVID crisis communication. And the strategies are in a way comparable to the, the meta strategies, let's put it this way. The meta strategies are comparable for both country cases. Um, so both uh, use uh, geopoliticization, both use um, attention shifting to other environments, to other uh, countries, and both uh, use um, in one way or another endorsement of the political elites or uh, of the decision makers. However, the way or the particular, the actual strategies are different. So the extent to which, uh, especially Russian Institute for Strategic Studies, and I must say, this is also uh, an interesting case in the sense that all post-Soviet states have comparable institutions. 
Like there is the Russian Institute of Strategic Studies, there is in Kazakhstan Kazakh Institute of Strategic Studies. Uh, in the case of Ukraine, there is also an institute, a national institute of strategic studies. So you can find similar structures in all post-Soviet countries, which is in a way this post-Soviet legacy, if you will. Um, and if we compare how RIS, how Russian Institute of Strategic Studies communicated COVID, and how Kazakh Institute of Strategic Studies communicates COVID, there is certainly difference. Um, the Kazakh Institute of Strategic Studies was much, much more careful in the selection of particular wording, in the selection of uh, metaphors, in the selection of language, basically. So the language was used differently. Um, so the strategies, the actual discursive strategies were different, while the meta strategies were comparable. So I can talk in a more systematic way about those two cases where I worked with the data. I did not analyze in a similar way other political settings, uh, so I cannot really say how much we can generalize to the case of China, for instance. Would they there, would Chinese think tank communicate COVID-19 in a similar way, using similar discursive strategies? Um, possibly, yes, but um, it would be anecdotal evidence if I would be, you know, telling you about that. Thank you. Yeah, please. So thank you, Vera. I missed the first part of your presentation, um, but it's it's very interesting what I just heard. Um, I'm just wondering whether the limitations of the perceived limitations of the Russian approach you presented, it is caused by epistemological constraints or it's more ideological um constraints because it, it sort of uh replicates uh the, the issue you mentioned this the advisory function and the public communication function whether the think tanks they actually know um sort of ha have a, a, a relatively objective overview of the situation but they chose to communicate this way or they genuinely think um, they're convinced of what they are communicating. I mean, in in thank you, thank you so much for this question. I mean, this is um, always this is one of the trickiest questions, of course, to uh, differentiate between the public domain of the uh, think tank activities and what is happening behind closed doors. And in the case of Russia. Uh, because my project started in mid-2021, basically there was not, not much time left already to conduct you know, field work and uh, that I initially planned to do also in the case of Russia and collect also expert interviews in order to see how Think Tank's internal kitchen works. Um, we cannot also look into the experts' uh, heads, right? So we cannot really um, see how they think, what they think, and whether they actually believe what they publish. Um, what I could do in this project uh, was to compare this public and private domains of think tank activities for the case of Kazakhstan. Um, and this is, I mean, also there, you, you can always doubt, of course, whether think tankers, once you interview them, would tell you the truth, whether they would share the information, right? Uh, they would share their actual beliefs and views, or whether they would be still perceiving that as a kind of public engagement right now with an external interviewer. In many cases, I was surprised how frank think tankers were in their interviews with me, maybe because I am from Kazakhstan myself and they perceived me as partly as, um, uh, an, as a partial insider in a way. Um, what I found very interesting there was that there is a difference basically depending on who you talk to and which kind of think tank we're talking about so if this is one of those larger state-funded think tanks um, many of those who are in the leadership positions they will be in the interviews at least very careful in formulating and conveying similar messages as they do in their public domain so as they do in their publications in smaller think tanks, 
And of course, those who do not work in, in those bigger think tanks anymore, but, but used to work there. And I, I was lucky to interview a couple of, of them as well. Um, you find that there is sometimes also a gap in a way between what is actually known, what is actually believed by experts, and what is getting published. In some cases, and it actually um, created a lot of frustration among less senior experts in the think tanks, um, was that they would prepare their reports for internal use. They would send it upstairs, so to say, they would send it to more senior staff of the think tanks, and they would not even get feedback whether it gets to where it was intended to go to the uh, tables of the presidential administration. So in some cases, they would only, some time has passed, and they would hear in, the, in some public speeches of senior officials, the same thoughts that they expressed in their internal reporting. And that's how they know that there is, you know, uh, there is some kind of, if not influence or impact, then at least an effect of speech writer. So you as an expert produce knowledge, communicate this knowledge internally, and then it gets to be communicated externally by others. And this is your knowledge. So there is this link and this link is traceable, at least in some of the environments, not necessarily in the case of Russia, especially not now. Actually, I just might jump in with a question if that's okay. You know, th 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 this was a truly fascinating um, talk. Many of the questions that arise in this area are fine grain questions that are hard to answer actually. Uh, and I was just thinking, you know, to my own fieldwork experiences uh, at one stage, I was doing a lot of uh, interviewing of uh, lobbying organizations and indeed think tanks in the United States. And the most valuable documents I found were the internal ones, the ones that weren't public. And you hinted at this in your um, talk right at the end, you indicated that there was some internal reporting between RIS and, and the government. But th this is really, um, dark data, isn't it? Because it's actually very difficult to get a hold of. And I would occasionally, you know, would be lucky enough to to get a hold of this either because, uh, you know, they, they somehow took a shine to me as a result of the interview and they thought that I was trustworthy and so on and so forth. But it is actually very difficult to get a hold of this data. Um, now, you know, one might also ask in the case of these state-sponsored um, think tanks, what relationship they would have with the intelligence agencies of a, uh, an authoritarian regime. And here one unfortunately is just driven into sort of speculative hypotheses. I mean, you know, to what extent, for example, would it be useful for an authoritarian state to simply have uh, an echo in the form of a think tank, or would the think tank genuinely have an independent voice here that the state could use to cross check its own internal capacities? Now, you know, these are all, I think, important and interesting questions, but extraordinarily difficult to get a handle on unless one did some indirect, found indirect ways of getting at that question, uh, and I don't know how one that would do. I, I mean, have you conducted, for example, a fine grain analysis of each of the employees of, of these think tanks? You know, what are, their, what are their backgrounds? I mean, this was something that I found was very useful because, you know, we all know about the concept of the revolving door, for example. And so, you know, in many of the cases where I would be interviewing people in the United States, there was, um, you know, quite a revolving door between between think tanks, business, and the and the bureaucracy. So, sort of tracking, as it were, the movements of people in and out of these think tanks. So it isn't just a question of leadership; it's actually a question of you know who are the analysts working for the think tank and what are their their backgrounds. And I guess my final point would be that, to some extent. Um, 
state-sponsored think tanks that confined themselves to the extreme sort of geo invest in the extreme geopolitical politicization of things to some extent hamper their capacity don't they i mean to some extent to you know to what extent are they going to have a really technical influence in areas that matter okay so you know you can get so much mileage out of you know controversial rhetorical pieces on COVID. that's not actually all that hard to do but let's say you really want to play some long-term game in influencing technical standards you know in the telecommunications sector well you know there you actually have to have some real technical expertise right and and you can't really play that long-term game if you've just got a bunch of political hacks working for you because you know their attention spans pretty limited it's kind of lurching from one crisis to the another so i i do wonder to what extent if you're a serious think tank and engaging in technical issues that matter to a state in the long term and for example standard setting to what extent you're really going to be a player you know there it's much more a kind of complex epistemic community game isn't it where the think tank in a way can get marginalized particularly if it's hiring the wrong kinds of people There is also a question by Gabi. Should we go Yeah, yeah, please. Go, go ahead. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vera. And thank you um, for the presentation. Um, it was, wait a sec, let me just change. Here we are, the gallery. Um, it was really, really interesting um, and 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 um, actually expanding on what we discussed previously. Um, I, 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 I think I have a question, particularly on the case of Kazakhstan, because what you said in, in, in the end, um, on your insights and on um, also the this element of it seems um, anticipatory self censorship, saying something it reports different, um, and and what Peter just said on the official links to potential in, in intelligence units made me think of two things: one structural and one of the human dimension. If you if you look into Kazakhstan and compare with um, with Russia, are there still um, as you said, there seems to be still influences in um, emulation of the overall landscape mm, of the older institutional setup and structure of the think tank environment. If you look into the newer cases, um, has this emancipated a bit? Has this changed the newer think tanks that were developed? Or is there still a certain emulation of the overall Russian um, landscape? now Russian and Soviet landscape in terms of the types of institute, the types of function that you see. Um, and link to that, the question on the, the human dimension. Do you see in, in the um, experts and the think tankers that you're in, in contact with shifts and changes in socialization and education? So does that somehow shift it from a more Russian um, based education um, and and um, uh, growing into a type of intelligentsia function to a more Anglo-Saxon one uh, on the personal level has the education and the 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 overall um, um, personal patterns of think tankers changed in Kazakhstan and would you, would you generally think that the Kazakhs system is still somehow captured by the Russian institutional traditions. Um, that would be very interesting for me to understand if there are post-Soviet traces of, of somehow still capturing the system. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, all super fascinating questions. Why don't you try to answer those? Well, for makes and then we'll take another round of questions. So just okay. answer those two, and then we'll kick off with another okay. round. Okay, right. Uh, Peter, thanks so much. Uh, I mean, one question that uh, that you asked was about the connection with the intelligence services, and of course, I mean, this is also related to your final question about sort of who the people actually are and whether this is possible to trace their biographies in a way. Yes. And 
And this question, I have to say, can be answered, or this relates very much to this differences between democratic and non-democratic contexts. Because if you think about uh, think tanks in the US, in most of the cases, you would be able to see on the websites who the people are who work there. In the case of uh, Russia, in the case of Kazakhstan, this is only the case for the top management of the think tanks, if at all. So you can, um, so without getting into the field so, yeah, and yeah. getting context of the people in the visible dimension of who runs the business in those think tanks, you would see only the top leadership in open access, so to say. And there you can make the links. There you can do biographical research and can make the links, for instance, like in the case of Ries, the director of Radkov, this is written else, uh, everywhere pretty much, uh, where he comes from, what he had it before, uh, what his sort of career, uh, how his career looked until then. So you can anticipate at least, even without going too much in depth into his biography, where and how he was sort of baked and cooked before he started heading this institution. And a similar way you can do that also for the larger think tanks in, in Russia and in Kazakhstan for, for other think tanks that are state linked. Um, in the case of smaller think tanks, which are not as much linked to the state, so are also not directly funded by the state, but sort of through three other channels, although it might be still state funding, so their funding is less secured. They also have less capacities to maintain transparent websites, or they also have limited incentives to maintain transparent websites for whatever reasons. In some cases, these are just one-man shows. So this is one person who is heading a think tank, and there are a couple of uh, lower level employees, if at all. Um, and then you might not even have a website. So if you know who the person is who is heading the think tank, you would be able to, you know, trace the career of the person and know to some extent whether there are links to intelligence services or not. What is interesting um, is that the, the, I mean, there is the policy of revolving doors also in environments like that. It functions slightly differently. Uh, it functions or it resembles slightly more the U.S. pattern in the case of Ukraine, especially after 2014, when you had a lot of people who were part of civil society and state independent think tanks who moved suddenly to the political positions. And then there was sort of change going back and forth in a way. That is less the case in, in Russia or in Kazakhstan. Or at least it's less visible. And what I also found very interesting also in relation to, to one of your questions in terms of also these connections and not only the connections of the people themselves and their biographies to intelligence agencies or services, but also the knowledge. And my assumption before I was starting the field work was that uh, people working in state linked think tanks would naturally have access to some secure data, to some data which is not in open access and which is provided by intelligence. Because otherwise, how would they be able to analyze security issues, for instance? In, in the case of Central Asia, a lot of uh, reports produced by think tanks go in the direction of security related to Afghanistan, for instance. Where would you draw the data? Where would, would the data come from if not from intelligence? Once I started doing interviews, that hypothesis was not confirmed at all. Uh, quite on the contrary, I was told that this, uh, the uh, think tankers, in order to get access to classified uh, data, they would need a particular permission uh, and go through a particular process, which is a very technocratic and complicated process. And that would make them also uh, non travelers in a way. So if they get this permission to access secure data, they are basically staying in the country all the time. They cannot leave anymore the country because every time once they leave the country, they would require a particular permission to go to an international conference, for instance. Mm. So it is actually not in their personal interest to gain access to such data. So in many cases, they are drawing the analysis on data which is in open access. And not only that, in many cases, this is also limited by language because many state-sponsored uh, think tankers do not have many language, you know, 
uh, knowledge of other languages than Russian and Kazakh, for instance, in the case of Kazakhstan, which means that they draw only on particular sources of data that they can analyze for their reporting, both internal and public. Um, and this uh, is regarded as a severe limitation also by think tanks themselves. So they know that they have a problem and there is not much they can do about it, but they acknowledge it at least. Um, now to the uh, to the questions uh, by Gabi, uh, the structural and the human dimensions in a way of um, sort of this uh, Russia's influence and Russia's or post-Soviet in a way legacies and how much that is still present. Um, in the case of Kazakhstan, they are very present and they are not only the post-Sovietness, so to say, present, but the actual Russian influence right now. I actually had exactly that question in my interview guideline. And what I was told uh, was that uh, the Kazakhstanese think tank market, it is a very small market. So there are basically two, two cities, uh, the capital city Astana and the largest business sort of capital of the largest city, Almaty, where think tanks are mainly located. Um, so the market of think tanks is much, much smaller than the Russian one, but it is a smaller copy, and I'm citing basically a couple of people who are telling me that, of Russia's think tank market. Um, not only that, uh, there are also deliberate efforts uh, by Russia um, to create networks of think tanks uh, among the members of the Eurasian Economic Union. So there is literally a network based or on the basis of the Eurasian Economic Union. So the member states of the union are connecting their think tanks together. And as part of this exercise, they actually did a couple of years ago, a mapping of think tanks based in all of those countries. And you can find this data, which is very convenient for me, of course, because then I know, okay, what, what the basic characteristics of the think tanks are. Uh, so for someone who does research on them, this is convenient, but that also tells us a lot of how Russia still is trying to, or again, is trying to influence uh, this space also through the production of expert knowledge and connecting those who produce this expert knowledge. And the human dimension, I mean, it is related to the structural dimension, of course. Uh, and what you see is that the more senior generation of um, experts, um, of think tankers, in, in the case of Kazakhstan, I'm now talking specifically, um, there is a division of those who were educated in Moscow and St. Petersburg, and those who were educated in top Kazakh SSR-based uh, universities back then. Um, because the market is so small, they still are very well connected and they all know each other very, very well, regardless of whether they are sort of the, those core, larger, completely state-based think tanks, basically, and those who are regarding themselves slightly as more independent of the state. Um, all of them are very well connected. Those of them who are who are educated in Russia, of course, have somewhat better personal links also to experts from Russia. But if you consider that some of the uh, uh, think tankers of Kazakhstani think tankers are actually writing for Russian think tanks and not only Valdai because Valdai also published there, you know, Belgian and German uh, experts, but also other think tanks, then there is a huge connection between Russian think tanks and, uh, and Kazakhstani think tanks and think tankers. Um, on a personal level and on a professional level. And um, in a way, if you look also at the events that they organize, um, they basically go back and forth sometimes. So they invite Russian think tankers to events in Kazakhstan and vice versa. And that is very different in the case of Ukraine. One of the questions that I was asking also sort of how, how many connections were still left uh, between Ukrainian and Kazakhstani think tanks. Um, and only in one case, it was told to me that there were joint projects between a state independent think tank in Kazakhstan and uh, a couple of Ukrainian think tanks. And that was also the only interview where it was confirmed to me that the start of the full-fledged war in Ukraine had an impact on the work of the think tank in Kazakhstan. Um, so in terms of you know this post-Sovietness, you see also another trend that in the for, in terms of the connections between Kazakhstan and Ukraine, the links between the think tanks 
uh, started disappearing after 2014 and almost disappeared by 2022. Thank you very much. I think there was a question over here and perhaps any other questions will... Okay, so we'll go around the table. And, and then <laughs> so, there's still one in the in the chat. Another all right. Question. Okay. And then we'll finish up with one in the... All right, let's start here. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, thank you, Vera, for such an interesting presentation. Um, it's... What I was wondering with all of this, obviously it's very specific to the context of both Russia and your other work that you're mentioning. Um, but I am, and I'm thinking of the title of this, which had the frame Global North, and then presentation to me seemed quite framed around, you know, perhaps different types of autocratic to hybrid regimes. And I'm wondering in terms of the observations you're making and some of the conclusions you're drawing beyond just to these, these empirical con um, contexts, I'm wondering how much do these scope conditions matter in the sense of, I mean, obviously I'm I'm thinking in the American context of, how our think tanks operate in quite a similar, um, you know, they, they might be aligned with the party in power, they might not. Um, so I just wonder if the things that you're observing, can they travel in a sense to broader democratic contexts or global Northern contexts, or is there something that's very unique um, to the context that you're working in that might not actually travel as well? Thank you, Vera, for your uh, presentation. My question is about measuring the effectiveness of think tanks. If you could uh, think of one or two indicators of how to measure the effectiveness of think tank activities. Thank you. I'm disturbed by the term think tank. Okay, this reflects me in my own writing on think tank um, at the moment, because I think the phrase think tank itself is a term from what you call the global north, and that's pretty much how you, you started off the definition. And I think of the term think tank as being a hegemonic Western import, okay, to describe Russian entities. So I'm wondering, is there perhaps buried in... Um, local Russian understandings um, an understanding of these organizations that has roots in Russian political culture and history that is a different term or a different uh, label. So in a way I'm asking, do we need the Western interpretive lens of think tank? Um, and can we perhaps find an alternative label to um, address these bodies? In which case does it raise different research questions about independence? Because the Western set of definitions of think tank are not like mine that you put up, okay? They tend to stress that, um, not all definitions, but most definitions tend to place them, place think tanks in civil society or at arm's length um, and quite distant from the powers that be. Yeah, this is turning into a mega round. So we've got one more question here and then we've got one. Uh... Thank you for your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is about um, the methodology for measuring this uh, influence. Uh, have you thought about going into the trajectory of these uh, experts and maybe compare them to the trajectory of uh, the uh, policy makers involved uh, in terms of education, um, age, uh, gender, um, everything you can uh, see as something that could make them close or closer and uh, uh, make them think in the same way. Thank you. Okay, our final qu question, Tatiana, please. Uh, yes. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. 
Uh, yeah, because I, I, I have a uh, not stable uh, connection, so that's why I, I can't use uh, my camera. I wanted to ask you uh, about the uh, networks, because you mentioned that also uh, Russia encourages uh, like uh, think tank networks. And can you tell, so what is the advantages for, what are the advantages for uh, think tanks to join these networks? Is it like additional funding, as in the case of uh, European uh, Union, which also encourages uh, networks? Um, at the EU level. And also I have another question about the uh, also the number of uh, think tanks in these uh, countries because at the beginning of your presentation you uh, mentioned this uh, um, index of think tanks of Mangan which uh, was <laughs> widely also criticized and also uh, can you also tell that actually these numbers reflect the reality in these countries or maybe uh, like it's uh, overestimation or maybe underestimation of the like, real numbers. Thank you. Yeah. And Vera, there's still one written in the chat from Umesh. The question in the chat is um, how we can pursue the reality of the geopolitical Russia and its surroundings while we cannot trust the kinds of information coming from media and state as well as non-state actors such as think tanks well i think that, that can, we'll make that the last question yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> so you've got two, three. <laughs> okay i have a couple now i'll try to to be quick considering uh bearing in mind the time as well so the question of the global north um first of all i do not find the uh, differentiation of this binary between the global north and global south particularly helpful even though i actually put it sort of beyond the global north into the title of not only this uh, talk but also a talk i've given before um the reason why is that i mean being myself from kazakhstan i kind of let, end up being in this liminal space between wh where I, where I am am i am i part of global north am i part of global south global east or where do you put myself or I put myself. And the same for a couple of you, you know, for the case of Kazakhstan as such as my one of my country cases. So while this strict differentiation is not necessarily helpful, what I'm looking at, or the country cases that I look at, they are definitely beyond the global north, right? I mean, they might be part of global south or global east or something else, but they are beyond the global north. In that case, I kind of, I kind of find it helpful. To what extent, the are um, you know these scope conditions would be helpful i think this is probably then referring more to the regime types and subtypes would be more helpful to make this to try to make this connection um i have abandoned in a way this idea in this project to try to do that because initially as i said my my choice of country cases was driven exactly by that incentives that i would be doing you know cross country comparison in a more straightforward way. However, as the regime sort of developed, evolved further, I find it relatively difficult to pinpoint even the scope conditions to a particular regime type or subtype. You probably, and not only probably, you need more country cases in order to be able to do that. So I hope, and one of the follow-up projects at some point, if I get enough funding to do that, I get to actually do exactly that to, to you know, pinpoint the scope conditions to particular regime types. But I think some of the things can actually travel. And there have been attempts also in the literature, at least to, to look into how uh, the Western ideas of think tanks can be adapted to what is called de-democratizing context. Yeah, so those uh, political regimes that have been already or have democratized throughout the history. So Eastern Europe, for instance, if you look into members of the European Union, Eastern Europe, and how they then started de-democratizing again, how think tanks work there. And there we can see that many ideas, they do travel and they can, in, in, in adapted form, they are being used. Um, I fully agree with you, Diane, just to jump to this, because that connects in a way that um, this is a Western important uh, imported uh, concept. And you also see it very much in how think tanks as non-governmental actors developed in the 1990s in the post-Soviet space. Uh, because the idea of a neoliberal think tank 
that is something which emerged in the 1990s in that space. So in the countries that sort of emerged after the collapse of the Soviet Union, that was definitely something which was brought from outside. And you definitely need to differentiate them from those uh, that were reformed or rebuilt on the pre-existing structures. Um, in the case of Russia and many other post-Soviet states, what you had before were the, the, the so-called research institutes as part, for instance, of the uh, Academy of Sciences back then Soviet and then later national also academies of sciences, they are not completely comparable because their possibility or their both their uh, opportunities to influence policy, their intentions to influence policy, but also the means or the tools that they used to advise political decision makers, they were very different from those uh, think tanks that we are now observing, the neoliberal type of think tanks. And that you can see even more so in the case of Ukraine, I think, where uh, because in the case of Ukraine, you've had more training activities for the think tankers, for the state independent think tankers, including through the Soros uh, think tank program. So there you definitely observe a huge difference between those who position themselves completely as state independent neoliberal type of think tank, which very much was influenced by the US idea of think tanks, um, and those that are linked to the state and nevertheless do perform the think tank functions by using very different means and channels. And what is interesting for the case of Ukraine, and I think this is also very telling, is that the has been recently a mapping study of Ukrainian think tanks that was published together by a German think tank, Institute of European, Gabi, you know it, of uh, EAP in Berlin, the Berlin-based, and the DIF in Ukraine, which is a Ukrainian state independent think tank. And they prepared a huge mapping study of Ukrainian think tanks and also looked into how they adapted to the new situation of war in terms of their structures. Uh, so how they reacted, whether they continue their activities and so on. And what is interesting that this mapping exercise actually excluded the state links think tanks. They actually just did not include them because they did, did not regard them as think tanks worth mentioning in this mapping exercise. Despite the fact that those are there and they also perform think tank functions. Um, okay, methodology and Jana's question about effectiveness, they're in a way linked, I guess. So methodology for measuring influence um, and effectiveness. Effectiveness is less frequently used in the analysis of think tanks, I would say. So it is more the question of influence, perceived influence or impact. But if you were to translate, and I mean, those are different concepts, right? But if you were to translate impact into effectiveness, effectiveness in the sense that there are particular goals that think tanks put for themselves or objectives, and they want to achieve them in terms of the change of policy, then theoretically, this would be doable in the sense that um, you could establish whether think tanks were trying to put something onto the political policymakers agenda, and to what extent exactly those proposals were taken on board by the political decision makers. So your indicators would be based on how much of the text that were produced in a way by the think tanks taken into a legislative initiative, for instance. And that would be also um, probably one of the ways to measure, one of the good ways to measure influence of think tanks in terms of influence on policy making. We also always need to, to ask a question, influence on, on what? Um, measuring influence in terms of the uh, biographies, in terms of what, what you were asking about, sort of um, you would need network analysis for that in a way, right? To see how people are connected. And I responded to that in part when I was responding to, to Peter that this is a very difficult, not completely impossible, but very difficult exercise to do because the biographies are not necessarily transparent enough. Um, 
you also need to be rather cautious if you are just drawing on biographies and see that people studied at the same time at the same institution, that doesn't mean they are connected very well, right? So if you were to assume that just because they were institutionally united at some point, they would bear the same ideas and those ideas would stay with them for years and would influence their thinking like years later, that is not necessarily always the case, right? So that would be a, a speculation in a way. So you need other research tools in order to figure out which ideas actually form those personalities and how much of those ideas are flowing into their reporting, into their analysis later. And um, network analysis not necessarily is the best tool to do that. Um, and also the question on networks by Tatiana. So uh, to what extent there are some incentives for think tanks to join those? I'm not aware of funding being dispersed specifically to think tanks who are joining the, the network. Uh, that is rather that the network provides an additional channel for organizing events. And in that sense, also providing funding. And this is how this network is in a way is maintained and the contacts are maintained, that there is a possibility by joining the network that you would be attending those events, connecting to the people and exchanging knowledge. And that creates in a way an incentive of course for people because they, as I said, this is one of the sources of their knowledge in a way too, because there are sources of, of where they can get data and where they can get further knowledge are relatively limited. So they would use this opportunity too. And the numbers uh, and the uh, questionable sort of methodology behind the go global go-to think tank index reports, um, I fully agree with that. Uh, I questioned it myself. Uh, I once was asked myself to, to fill out those forms uh, that they distributed in order to evaluate sort of how successful the think tanks are. Um, and there are a lot of questions that you can ask to, to their methodology. And the numbers are not necessarily reflected, uh, the actual numbers in what they report. Um, there is, I mean, for the lack of better statistics, it's still nice to use it in a way or illustrative at least to use it to show the, you know, the global distribution in a way. But if you look more in depth into how they collect data, which think tanks, how, name which other think tanks in order to be included into the report, um, then the numbers that come out, they do not necessarily reflect the actual even numbers, not even speaking about the quality of work of the think tanks. Um, for instance, in the case of uh, Ukraine, right now there are between 80 and 90, depending on the exact definition of think tanks that you are using, but up to 90 think tanks that are more or less active. This is a very broad, if you're using very broad definition. They are certainly not, you would not find 90 in the global go to think tank report from 2020, which is the latest one available. So I would also say that we need to be very cautious with these reports for some illustrative purposes. As I said, they might be helpful, but for the others, not necessarily. The question that was in chat, I'm not quite sure how to answer that because uh, I mean, what what can we do about that? If that is exactly the, que the question, I understood that. So how can we pursue the reality of the geopolitical Russia and its surroundings? Um, I think that the analysis that I'm doing tells us something about how knowledge is produced and communicated in Russia. Um, it doesn't necessarily tell us what to do with it. That would be a very different question. And I think um, that you need much more, you know, much, much broader research in order to, to answer this particular question. Uh, I guess my study is also not too surprising in its findings in a way that you would say, okay, Yes, think tanks now are also, in a way, endorsing the state and also serving as, as an additional channel of propaganda, of state propaganda. So, yes, that kind of confirms us the reality of today. What I think is surprising, though, or what surprised me is that my study 
is drawing on the time period before 2022. And by just analyzing, not actually, and I'm, I was not analyzing the publications related to Ukraine. I was analyzing deliberately other crisis instances. And nevertheless, I find this. And what is surprising, I think, if we know that, how didn't we see it coming with Ukraine? I think that is the interesting sort of finding or the question also here. Okay, you actually finished exactly on time. Uh, thank you very much for all that, uh, for all those questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much for all coming along, both to people online and to people in the room. Thank you very much for your questions, which were, of course, stimulated by a really excellent paper. So I'd like to thank thank Vera for that. Um, and I think we can all go and ponder more. You've whetted our appetites. Thank you very much.